Let's dive into another week of our four and a half year verse by verse journey through all of God's inspired word. We are currently kind of wrapping up things in the Old Testament and looking at the last couple of psalms that we've reserved back for this time period. I think these psalms, these hallelujah psalms, are celebrations of the reinstatement of the Israeli people back into their homeland and back underneath this covenant that they've they've reinitiated thanks to the work of Ezra and Nehemiah. And they've even signed off on this new covenant. And so lots of praise due to God during this time period. So we're kind of looking right now at Psalm 106, which is a hallelujah psalm, which means it starts with the Hebrew word hallelujah. Praise he who is. And it also has the line of, Oh, give thanks to he who is, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And that's very much a favorite line of the Jewish people uh, whenever they're praising God. Now, last week, we finished off up through verse 15 of this psalm. Uh, It's a history lesson. It's a reminder of how things went through the history of Israel, always focusing on the idea that God is due glory regardless of what the people might do sin-wise. So verse number 16 takes us back to the time of the Exodus. When men in the camp were jealous of Moses and Aaron, the holy ones of he who is, the earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. Fire also broke out in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. So this was one of the times uh, that people thought that they could do better than Moses and Aaron and tried to assert that uh, leadership much to their own, uh, their own loss because God broke out against them in divine fire. Verse number 19, a very famous episode. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped a metal image. Horeb, just another very ancient name for Mount Sinai. And this is the golden calf incident that happened uh, while Moses was up on Mount Sinai for 40 days. And Aaron was giving in to the pressure of the people that they should give up on Moses and just keep on into the promised land, and they needed some visual representation of the God uh, that had brought them out of Egypt. And so one of the gods the Egyptians count as their creator is often imaged by a full-grown bull. And so that's what uh, apparently Aaron very foolishly gave in to doing for them. Uh, And here's the critique, verse 20. They exchanged the God of glory, or the glory of God, for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. So in falling into idolatry, they were already forgetting the lessons that God does not need an image to represent him because he has all power. Verse 23, Therefore he said he would destroy them had not Moses his chosen one stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. And we talked about that when we were doing the history uh, back in the time of uh, Moses that God already knew how he was going to move forward with the Israelis at that point. He was giving Moses the chance to step in and act as intercessor. And so God says, well, I could destroy them. Just get out of my way and I'll do it. And Moses' response is, no, you promised. You made promises that have to be kept. You can't destroy them out here. And so that allowed Moses to be the great intercessor. Verse 24. Then they despised the pleasant land, having no faith in his promise. They murmured in their tents and did not obey the voice of he who is. 
And therefore he raised his hand and swore to them that he would make them fall in the wilderness and would make their offspring fall among the nations, scattering them among the lands. Now that's a historic reference to when they were getting ready to go into the promised land. Uh, During the second year of the Exodus, that was on the schedule, and they sent the spies in, and those spies came back, and ten of them gave bad reports. That's the despising of the pleasant land. Uh, Warned that there were giants in the land that were going to eat them up. It was dangerous in there, and the cities were unconquerable. And so God said, fine, you don't get to go in. This generation is going to die out here in the wilderness. And he gave them a 38-year timeout for a total of 40 years in the wilderness. Verse number 28. Then they yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor and ate sacrifices offered to the dead. Now, this is a historic reference to what happened in that 40th year of the Exodus when Israel was encamped on the plains of Moab just across the Jordan River from Jericho. And uh, the Moabite king uh, could not figure out how to take them on in the physical world. So he hired Balaam, the prophet, to come out of Mesopotamia and put a curse on them. And uh, he couldn't do it. God wouldn't let him. And So finally, in order to get paid, he gave the advice to the king of Moab, this is what you need to do you need to set up a really big ceremony, a celebration, a party, a festival uh, for your God, Baal, and then invite all the young people, you know, the teens and 20-somethings and 30-somethings from the Israeli encampment to come over and join you in this. And uh, then when they do, God will punish them as a whole. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, because these younger people came over and engaged in this immoral worship, which included getting drunk and uh, having sexual relations and bowing before the idol and eating the food that had been offered to the idol. And then they actually took some of that junk, that behavior, uh, back to the camp itself. And uh, Phineas, who's going to come up in the story in just a moment, actually executes one of them on the spot for trying to bring that pagan worship back into the Israeli holy encampment. And so that's the uh, the context. Verse 29, They provoked he who is to anger with their deeds, and a plague broke out among them. Then Phinehas, so he's the third generation of the Aaronic priesthood, uh, the grandson of uh, Aaron and uh, the uh, son of Eleazar. Uh, Phineas stood up, intervened, and the plague was stayed. That was, it was stopped. And that was counted to him as righteousness from generation to generation forever. And Phineas becomes a very um, heroic figure in the stories of his family. It's interesting, I'm doing a lot of reading and studying through uh, Josephus, uh, the first century Jewish historian, who was a priest. And it just so happens that he is a direct descendant of Aaron through Phineas. And so uh, that's a pretty big deal for him. Verse number 32, They angered him at the waters of Meribah, and it went ill with Moses on their account, for they made his spirit bitter, and he spoke rashly with his lips. So on more than one occasion, the people grumbled, they wanted water, and Moses provided it uh, in the appropriate fashion. Uh, But one last time, when they were griping about water, uh, he'd had his fill, and he allowed himself to cross a line. And he struck the rock twice instead of just once, And he also said, must we continue to provide for you, you rebels? And uh, when he did that, he took the glory upon himself and he deviated the people's attention away from God. 
And he also, I think, broke up a symbol of how the rock Jesus was only struck once uh, in order to provide uh, the water of life, not twice. Uh, But anyway, that's where Moses is told, all right, you don't get to go into the promised land. You can see it from a distance, but you're not allowed to go into it. And he was quite upset with the people uh, for uh, their contribution to his bad attitude that day. Verse number 34, they did not destroy the peoples as he who has commanded them, but they mixed with the nations and learned to do as they did. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood, and thus they became unclean by their acts and played the whore in their deeds. And so this is a reference to how, even though they were warned, don't intermarry with non-believers, they did it anyway. And this had the inevitable result that they started going soft on this pagan worship and then eventually started adopting it as their own. And they even killed some of their own children as part of the abominable practices of uh, the worship of Molech Chemosh, the destroyer god, where they, uh, the ceremony of, of celebration uh, was always, uh, uh, it was always inclusive of getting drunk, having sex, and then burning up the babies from the last time that this happened. Verse number 40. Then the anger of he who is was kindled against his people, and he abhorred his heritage. He gave them into the hand of the nations, so that those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their power, and many times he delivered them. But they were rebellious in their purposes and were brought low through their iniquity. And so that's the cycle that we see set up in the book of the Judges and which continues into the times of the kings, where as long as there's a good, strong leader, the people generally behave themselves. But the moment the strong leader is gone, the moment evil leaders arise, the people explode with their sinfulness, and then God has to bring judgment on them, uh, which causes them to repent And uh, the cycle starts all over again. And so that's encoded here, reminder that this is our history. This is the past. This is what has been the truth of our sinfulness and God's glory. Verse 44, Nevertheless, he looked upon their distress when he heard their cry. For their sake he remembered his covenant and relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. There's that chesed, the fact that God likes us. That's that's the theme at the very beginning of this psalm. So he relents of his judgment because he still wants relationship and is willing to work it out. He caused them to be pitied by all those who held them captive. And that's a reference to fairly recent history based on the time this psalm is written when in Assyrian and Babylonian exile, God eventually prompts Cyrus the Great to allow all ethnic Israelis to go to the land of promise if they wish to do so and reestablish the Jewish nation there, which they did. And so we've just seen them finishing the, the building of the walls around Jerusalem and the recommitment to the covenant as part of that return. Verse 47, Save us, O he who is our God, and gather us from among the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. And uh, you can be sure right there, the word save, Hoshea, uh, and the divine name can be combined together and we get Yehoshua, which is the name Jesus in Hebrew. So we got Jesus kind of encoded in here as the, 
the thing that is still future at the writing of this psalm that's going to save the people. And then gather us from among the nations. Well, they were being gathered right uh, in the time of uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua and Nehemiah and Ezra. But now there is the ultimate gathering that's supposed to happen. And that's the eternal gathering. And even those of us who are New Testament believers, we're looking forward to he who is salvation, splitting the skies and gathering us together from the dead, uh, from the living, transforming us and uh, bringing us into his eternal kingdom, into the new heaven and new earth in which righteousness dwells. And then verse 48, the wrap-up. Blessed be he who is the God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. So let all the people respond. That's the truth. I agree with it. I believe it. God is to be blessed. And then we praise he who is. We hallelujah uh, as this conclusion uh, to such a brilliant psalm. And then that leaves us only one last psalm that we haven't looked at in our three-and-a-half-year verse-by-verse journey, and that's Psalm 107. And here's what it says. Oh, give thanks to he who is, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. So there's our chesed again. There's our favorite line uh, for the Israeli people. He's good. And his chesed is forever. Uh, That's why we're supposed to give thanks. Verse 2, let the redeemed of he who is say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south. So you can appreciate how this psalm would be very significant in the time of the return. Uh, They want to encourage one another. We need to praise God because we have been redeemed out of the pagan lands, out of the faraway lands. We've been brought back to the Holy Land, back to the promised land from all the different directions of the compass. And we need to praise God. Verse 4, some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. So some people... Uh, Their experience uh, in the times of the exile was something like this. They didn't really find a place where they fit in well. Uh, And they had to wander around uh, and through some very inhospitable places. And so what did they do? Verse 6, Then they cried to he who is in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Now we've got the return adventure, don't we? Being brought to the city of Jerusalem to help in the reestablishment of the Jewish people in the land of promise. And then, verse 8, Let them thank he who is for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men, for he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. So God is wanting relationship. He's wanting it to be a good relationship. And so when we embrace that, when we come to him, we need to thank him for that. Verse 10, some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in afflictions and in irons, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. It is interesting that some of the people that went into exile uh, out of northern kingdom of Israel, out of the southern kingdom of Judah, they went not just simply as exiles, but they went as prisoners. They were in trouble. They were in chains, and they spent uh, time confined and doing hard work. Uh, And so now uh, is the reminder that that happened, but there is a solution to that. Verse 12, so he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. And then they cried to he who is in their trouble. And he delivered them out from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Now, at this point, 
it is, I think, fairly clear that we're jumping past the physical into the spiritual. That everybody finds themselves slaves to sin and death because of that sin. And we are in darkness. We're in the kingdom of darkness. But thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ the Savior, we have been transferred by his death and resurrection out of that place of darkness and death and of chains into the glorious light of his kingdom. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Let us let them thank he who is for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men, for he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts into the bars of iron. So I, I think that it is appropriate that we apply this to the physical as well as the spiritual realities uh, that we find ourselves in. If we uh, have been redeemed physically, we need to praise. If we have been redeemed spiritually, which we all have as believers, we definitely need to be praising. Some were fools through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquity suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. So, because of their sinful choices, they ended up with a rough life. And so, verse 19, they cried to he who is in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank he who is for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men, and let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds in songs of joy. So, no matter what the situation, when God redeems us, when he saves us out of the situation, we owe him praise. We need to be bragging about what he's done and uh, sing Uh, songs of joy, songs of sacrifice and thanksgiving. Uh, Verse 23, some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of he who is, his wondrous works in the deep. Uh, So some people have got this, this special perspective by being in the oceanic environment. There is something about being far from land especially if you get up into a storm that makes you realize how big God is because obviously he made this world and he's so much bigger than it. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. That's the troughs and the wave peaks. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits' end. Can you see the people on the deck going back and forth in this storm? Then they cried to the Lord, cried to he who is in their trouble, and he delivered them from their their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Now, does that make you think about Jesus calming the sea in the New Testament? It should. And verse 30, Then they were glad that the waves were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. And let them thank he who is for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. And then from ocean to desert, he turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground, a a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. So sometimes drought comes from the hand of God. He turns a desert into pools of water and parched land into springs of water. So sometimes it's the reverse. In his blessing, he brings water where there normally isn't water. And there he lets the hungry dwell, and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing, they multiply greatly, and he does not let their livestock diminished. Uh, When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow, 
He pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. So sometimes God judges people of high position, high power, because they are too full of themselves. So he judges them. He brings them down. But then verse 41, he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad and all wickedness shuts its mouth. So God sometimes uh, humbles the exalted and sometimes he exalts the humbled. And in all respects, God is due praise for that. Verse 43 and the finish. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let him consider the steadfast love of he who is. And that's very sage advice for us. Well, we've got about a minute left. And let me just kind of um, give a preview of where we're going to be when we come back. Uh, we have a time after about 12 years of leadership uh, in the, the renewed promised land that Nehemiah goes back to Babylon, back to Persia. And while he's gone, things fall apart because he's the strong leader. Uh, in fact, uh, the person who should have been the strong leader in his absence, that would be the high priest, allows some sinful things to happen. And so God's judgment is right on uh, the uh, edge of the life of the people in the promised land again. And uh, God even speaks a prophecy book to them right around this time that warns them that they need to get their act together. They need to realize who he is and the honor and the glory and the respect that he is due. And so that is the book of Malachi. And so we will start on the book of Malachi the next time we get into God's Word.